Hi, good evening. Good morning whenever you're watching this. If you're watching it live, good evening. I'm Parker with Act Your Page, and I am with Pete Blatchford, who has been acting with Act Your Page and um, came to us through Laura Four Scruggs and um, is not only an actor, but a scholar and an author. And I've had the uh, absolute delight to read his uh, his book, uh, Wicked Immoral and Utterly Bad, an Illustrated History of Chicago Theater. Let me move that way. Which is available through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, m multiple book outlets. So um, welcome, Pete. Can uh, you want to do a little introduction? Um, well, I think you did a, a nice one. I... Uh, as you say, I've, I've been acting here in Chicago for, uh, I'm afraid to say, almost 40 some odd years. Um, been dabbling in playwriting of, of late with uh, mixed results. Uh, but this uh, little uh, opus that, I, that we're going to be talking about tonight is sort of a, uh, uh, it was an ambition of mine when I uh, was in uh, grad school. Um, before we get too far along, I would like to give a big shout out to um, Jennifer Sowinski, without whom the book would not exist. Uh, she was my um, researcher, my editor, my gal Friday, and um, her. And, and this was actually the first time she actually put together a book. So uh, the fact that it came out as well as it did uh, speaks. Um, well of her abilities and talents, and I owe her everything. Wonderful. Well, I would say the two of you are a good team. Thank you. So you, um, you've been involved in Chicago theater for decades, and in, in what ways? Acting, playwriting, and then and anything else like is, is uh, I guess I should ask, have you been into play um, theater management? Have you gotten into that part of the game? Um, I've done, I've done some producing, uh, a friend of mine and I had a, a reader's theater company and producing as in, you know, getting the gigs, but it, because it was just the two of us, we were booking gigs in libraries and we're also writing the scripts and we were hiring the actors. Um, and then I, that carried over when, uh, when Tim decided that, um, he wanted to, uh, concentrate full time on his own business. And uh, I started a new company called Pendragon Players. And I carried, carried took what I had learned from uh, Beowulf Theater Company and uh, carried on. Okay, okay. So just a little bit more about you. What, why, why theater? What drew you to theater? I blame my mother, really. <laughs> I was- um, Hi, mom. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I, I can't tell you, I never had a burning desire to become an actor. Um, I, you know, mothers just know things about their children and she sensed something uh, that I had some sort of ability. Um, and one day when I was walking out of the house, I must have been about 11 or 12 years old, my mother uh, uh, called after me as I was leaving. She said, how would you like to take some drama classes? And I turned over my shoulder as I continued to walk and said, no, thanks. And uh, no sooner did I say that than I found myself enrolled in the Baker School of Fine Art in St. Charles, Illinois, and my life was never the same. I was going to say, have you looked back over your shoulder since and said no, thanks? Uh, no. In fact, I I get down on me knees and I, I thank my mother for that wonderful gift that she gave me. Okay. So it's been a good, it's been a good ride. It's been one of the few constants in my life. Um, and, and I, I, I don't take that for granted. I, I, I honestly, I'm, you know, for someone who, you know, never really sort of burned with the desire to become an actor, right. I've been very, very lucky. Had a lot of great opportunities. Some of them I sought out. A lot of them I didn't. Okay. They just kind of came my way. and That's nice. That's nice when that happens. So tell me about the book. How did the book, how did Wicked, Immoral, and Utterly Bad, 
Illustrated History of Chicago Theater. How did it get started? What was the impetus? Well, I was in graduate school working on my master's of fine arts degree at Roosevelt University. And I was um, interested in um, learning a little bit about Chicago theater history. Um, and I went to the library and I, I, could, I couldn't find anything. Uh, it was not nary a book. And I was kind of shocked and appalled. I mean, there were books on, you know, improv and there were books on uh, certain aspects of Chicago history, but not one that sort of like chronicled how it all came to be, you know, who were the first uh, theater pioneers. And I said, doggone it, I'm going to write one. And so after having done my initial research was on the um, Federal Theater Project here in Chicago, uh, uh, that sort of got the ball rolling because I had to go to places like the, not not just the um, Historical Society, well, what do they call it, the theater, the History Museum now, but I had to go to the uh, uh, Harold Washington at the time and, mm -hmm. and you know, to dig up some some uh, some information. So yeah, that's that's uh, that was the spark that, that lit the flame, and then it, it was there were big, large gaps in between. I <clears throat> I gave a few um, lectures, uh, which were um, well, they well, let's just say they, they didn't come off too well, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, you, you had to admire the kid for his gusto. You know, he had that moxie, wasn't afraid to go up there and kind of go. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. Uh, now I got something. Now you got something, yeah. So Chicago, you start with 1837, and you mentioned someone named the Fire King. Mm -hmm. Fireball eating uh, the Fire King. Why there? Why start there? Well, that was the first recorded uh, theatrical performance here in the city. Um, it was typical of the time you had, uh, you know, Chicago was the crossroads of the Midwest. And so a lot of um, um, itinerant theater companies would come through town for better or for worse. Um, it, they, uh, they, you know, they would come into town, they would take their money and boom, they'd be gone. And that's why the attitude toward theater uh, was, um, was not a good one, hence the title, which comes right. from the actual quote from uh, the Chicago, uh, not the Chicago City Council, but religious leaders at the time. Right. Their, right. That was their low opinion of, uh, of theater in general. Um, so yeah, and, and it took, so yeah, he was the, he gets credit because he was, among, he was the first recorded one. What, was he the first? We don't know. <clears throat> So that's it. yes, and you did say that the the wicked, immoral, utterly bad, and to be discouraged at any cost, right? Yes. And it because of the the vagrant, fly by night na nature of it is that was the basically why. So it wasn't that the actors were engaging in illicit activities, or it was just that they came and they left. Well, I think that because they were um, fly by night and they would you know take the money and run uh, oh, okay. there were certain assumptions made about them that these were you know these, these couldn't be morally good <laughs> people upright you know yeah uh, they, they, they had you know they had they would just come in you know and entertain you for a night and then they were gone and uh, and and it was so a reputation rightly or wrongly deserved. Uh, and I'm sure there were some unscrupulous uh, companies that came through mm -hmm. uh, that uh, this is, this reputation uh, was earned uh, by the theater in general, out of, out of, out of sheer ignorance and prejudice, of course, uh, years later, um, uh, baseball would suffer the same fate with uh, itinerary, uh, baseball teams coming in right uh, so yeah and i'm sure it's not the only uh entertainment um that ha that got that uh, notoriety absolutely so the um we t when you go from the fire king into alexander mckenzie and harry isherwood um and the wolf's point area so 
You mentioned something, um, first of all, why, why focus on them? And then you mentioned something about the panic of 1837 that, um, I, that they survive. So how, how do they get theater started in Chicago and how do they survive the panic? Well, they were among the first people to actually get a license to uh, produce theater in Chicago. The, uh, uh, interestingly enough, the lawyer representing uh, those uh, those gentlemen was Abraham Lincoln. Uh, was one of one of he was uh, one of his first gigs or his jobs as a professional lawyer, uh, and he uh, when he was living in Chicago. And you mention him later in the book, um, having <clears throat> possibly seen one of the performances of um, one of the Booths. Yes, yes. Well, the Booth family were. Um, very popular, yeah. yeah. They, were, they were huge, um, and they were uh, they were one of the top tier of the theater families uh, yeah. in the in the in America. Yeah, like the Barrymores. Yeah, um, and I think that uh, the reason that I mentioned um, those gentlemen was because they had intended to you know sort of create a good uh, reputation. They they had intended to stay, but the panic or depression of night of 1837 caused them to have to flee. You know, they, there was, they had, they had to go They They wanted to stay in Chicago, but they had to, they had to keep going because there was, they had any money. Uh, and they had, the, and by, uh, just by virtue of the fact that uh, the economy had taken gone South, uh, they too had to go where fortunes were better. Right which I'm right. sure, sure did not serve the uh, reputation of theater very well either. No, and um, it's funny because as I, I was going to come to this later, but uh, it ties in with what you just said because um, as I'm reading reading the book, what becomes really clear is that there is this, it's not a linear process, Chicago theater. It's really episodic and it's, a, it's quite often uh, a building, a genesis, a fire, ashes, and the phoenix. So, you know, there's this, you can almost define it by the fires, right? Indeed, indeed. And other economic uh, downturns. And other, and other catastrophes. So, so let's talk about that. How, you know, everyone thinks of the great, you know, the great uh, Chicago fire, 1871 and everything you know um what's her name the cow <laughs> it gets blamed this is o'leary's cow yeah this is o'leary's cow but that really and and of course the one the biggest and you talk about it rightly so is the iroquois um so how does disaster affect this trajectory of chicago theater development well in the case of um uh, mr mcvicker who um, was among who was the first um, theater opera, uh, entrepreneur uh, to well he had built on the success of his mentor John Rice right and he was the heir he was the heir and he took what John what he learned from John Rice and decided to build his own theater and what is remarkable about Mr. McTheater was that Mr. McTheater M Mr. Mr. <laughs> That's what I'm going to start calling you. Hi, Mr. McTheater. Mr. McTheater. Hi, Mr. McTheater. Uh, he, you know, apart from the, the excellent productions that he introduced and apart from the fact that, you know, he created such innovations as these these little... You know, Variety uh, intermission shows. Which would eventually be, become, you know, go to New York and become vaudeville. Right, right. Um, he... He didn't give up. Every time a disaster befell his theater, a fire, you know, fire broke out, it burned down, he rebuilt every single time. He was determined to, you know, uh, make, uh, create deep roots for theater to thrive in this city, no matter what. So, yeah, I think that that's, uh, apart from these, you know, the beautiful buildings that he, you know, that he built each time, uh, that's his legacy because theater or, you know, any, any sort of, uh, artistic endeavor can't thrive unless it has roots, you know, to, 
you know, right. to, or, sure. or fertile ground to that's right. get its roots. It can't be done. No. no. And, you know, we can come back to the idea of the, you know, the destructions, the destruction, how it was a force that shaped Chicago theater. But you're right, without longevity and buy-in, like the people like to say now, buy-in, right? City buy-in, public buy-in. Um, just a little off track, just to maybe to explain to people in the audience, why is theater and fire so often espoused? Like people say, why is it always a fi you know a theater that there's fire, and you know why? I know I know you're laughing because you know why. So what what was why was that? Why were we for fifty hundred years reading about theater fires? Well, I think um, you know my opinion is that uh, fire safety was kind of an afterthought. Yeah, um, and you know it's it's not that you know, producers of theater wanted audiences, you know, to, you know, be harmed in any way. Right. It's just that um, their idea was, you know, you know, we, we've got to, you know, we'll, we, you know, we'll, we'll create this space. Sure. You know, we'll make it, you know, we'll make it safe. Uh, but fire, but the, the um, there were no set fire laws uh, where it came to theater or I, or dare or I dare say uh, for you know many public places, and that's why the uh, the Iroquois theater fire is uh, that tragedy is so important because it established national fire laws for all theaters across the country, um, and as as disastrous and horrible um, a, a disaster as that was, you know we have you know out of the out of the ashes rose a phoenix and that phoenix was the national fire laws and we have uh, that disaster to thank for it yeah and you know and with theaters i think people you know say well why theater fire so a couple of things right one um the footlights would have been uh a burning right they would have been burning oil so a fire something flammable the curtains would have been like the perfect a mechanism for fire to travel from floor to ceiling. Mm -hmm. You know, this this have this fabric, that flammable fabric. And then whatever special effects were being done could have also um, you know, be again perfect, the perfect disaster, the perfect formula, recipe for disaster. And then the exits and the panic. And no one's think, you know, people are thinking, um, Maybe they should have been thinking like P.T. Barnum, right? This way to the egress. <laughs> right? right? Um, but people were, uh, the numbers far exceeded the the doors. And then with panic, that um, that was um, really uh, ensure the doom. So mm -hmm. let's talk about the Ir Iroquois fire. It does change fire safety. Unbelievable, the breadth of what happened there. Can you talk a little bit about how it started in the, I, I see, see 602 victims, right? The cast survives, yes. right? 300 and a cast of 348, it's unbelievable. Talk about cast of a thousands. Um, well, what happened? What happened? Well, basically it was cheaply built. Uh, it looked great. Uh, but they didn't want to spend a lot of money. Um, so, you know, everything that you saw was just, it was, it was subpar. It was, uh, the, the construction materials were not, you know, you know, top quality. And, you know, worst of all, when, the, you know, they did have fire doors and they, uh, but unfortunately they opened inward. So when people tried to escape, they Locked rushed the door. against the doors and they couldn't open them because the doors would open toward the audience. And so they were instantly trapped. Um, they did do a, a fire safety test, which was sort of right. mandatory. And that was you would pour kerosene on the uh, asbestos curtain and set right. it on fire. And if it didn't burst into flames, eh, good enough. We're good to go. Right. That's right. Right. <laughs> Okay. Uh, for me, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. it's on me. 
Come Great. on. Guys. I read that. I was I was stunned. I thought that was the litmus test. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of there's I can't remember the name of them. It's probably in the index of my book, but there's uh, there are some very good books that really go into detail about the Iroquois Theater Fire. If anyone's interested, and in, okay, uh, you can. And it's uh, not and, it, and it's 1903 that yes. this happens, yes. and at that point, um, the theater was quite popular. Yes. Um, because, if, right, with 602 victims, and again, the other thing that I read was, um, at first, um, people thought this was a special effect. They did. They did. Uh, local, um, local actor Eddie Foy, uh, who was one of the stars of the show, and they were just kind of looking around and going, hmm, this is kind of interesting. Right. And then when they realized what it really was. It was, it was rushed to the doors. If you see the Bob Hope films, The Seven Little Foys, there is a very brief scene in which the Iroquois theater fire is referenced. Um, you know, uh, and so, but he was, um, Eddie Foy was one of our, um, uh, one of our great local actors who went on to great fame and fortune, as did his, uh, his uh, Seven Little Foys. Right, right. So, anyway. Right. Um, speaking of which, that's kind of a good segue to talk about Joseph Jeff Jefferson and the Jeff Ooh. Awards, right? Doesn't so, oh. yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Let me show me all your Jeff Awards, Pete. Um, <laughs> so Joseph Jefferson, the third actor, um, who, um, ultimately had a bit of a, uh, of a fate like Eugene O'Neill's father, right? He became a one part player. Right. Well, from what I understand, at that time, um, it was, uh, I, I can't speak for, you know, um, uh, Mr. O'Neill, but it was desirable for an actor to have a role with which he could age with. Right. Because the nature of, uh, of an actor's career um, was so up and down. But if you could get, you know, typecasting was not necessarily a bad thing. It was, a, it was an income. It was an income. And it was right. kind of a family thing because his, his brother-in-law had written this script based on the Irving uh, story. And Washington Irving, Washington Sleepy Irving. Hollow Rip. He said, I am, I am, he is, I am Rip and he is I, something like that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, so it, it, it was for, in his mind, Rip was a very good thing. And he didn't just do Rip. He did, uh, he did other productions. He did productions of the rivals, and he was, um, I think, American was, cousin, our American cousin, right? And I think was, um, uh, the play that was playing at Ford's Theater mm -hmm. when, uh, uh, although he was not in that production, he that so he did branch out. But you know, for him, it was good, and and uh, and he, that's what he became known for. Uh, and he also helped, you know, s spread the word about Chicago and theater because he toured extensively. You know, um, uh, across this country and over certainly over to England. I don't know if he did Europe or not, but um, uh, so yeah, uh, it was it, it was uh, the thing, the, the gift that kept kept on giving for him. And you then know, when, toward the but, end of his career, they actually did a, a film version, a, a silent film of Rip Van Winkle with him. Yes, I mean with with Eugene O'Neill's father, James O'Neill he got cast into the Count of Monte Cristo. And whenever he tried to break away to try to do a different role, the audiences rejected it. Oh, okay. They wanted to see him in that role. And of course he made, you know, wads of money doing mm -hmm. that. But in a long day's journey to night, O'Neill gets in, he does talk about that, his father's deep regret. Mm -hmm. So Joseph Jefferson is so significant that we create this mon momentous award for Chicago theater, um, for anyone in Chicago theater, you know, that to be Jeff nominated and, um, and to be Jeff awarded is quite significant. Is. Why is he so important in terms of uh, Chicago theater history and so much so that he gets his, the award name? Well, I think because he was among the best because of his constant touring in this role, he became very well known. Um, and I think it's really just kind of as simple as that. Um, okay. And he 
furthered the reputation of theater in Chicago. And so, yeah, you know, he was well known. Um, people loved him in that role and they knew he was from Chicago. Uh, and I, I, there could be more to it than that, but if, it, if there is, I, I don't know. Okay. I want to jump back a little bit because we just kind of glossed over John Blake Rice. Um, um, I, something I found very interesting in the book, and if you're just tuning in, if you're just catching the interview, I'm talking to author Pete Blatchford, actor, author, producer, Pete Blatchford, about his book, Wicked Immoral, Utterly Bad, An Illustrated History of Chicago Theater. It's a fascinating book, and it's available Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop. hopefully your independent bookstore. And at the new uh, the the Newbury Library and the Goodman uh, Theater gift shop. Oh, excellent! Well done. That's a cool. I like that. That's a cool little gift shop. It is. It is. Um, it's, I can't afford to buy much from there, but it's a cool gift shop. Yeah. So you mentioned that John Blake Rice is a successful in theater for a couple of reasons, and one of them is because he segregates the social classes. What yeah. does that mean? How did that how did that get pulled off? Well, I think you know it was um, not unlike the uh, days when uh, in Shakespeare, where the classes were um, where the wealthier patrons were separated from the groundlings um, because um, they were they were less desirable. Uh, they didn't they didn't want to mix with them. And if you had uh, uh, if if to have a successful theater, you couldn't shut out uh, the poorer patrons because mm -hmm. they were entitled to have see a good show too, mm -hmm. but you couldn't have them sitting too near your wealthy patrons because, you know, they were the ones who uh, bought the, you know, box the, office the, and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, much like the box, box seats. And, uh, um, yeah. You know, and you think of the Titanic, right? The, 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 the classes and the birthing and the second and the first, um, so this then gives theater a different kind of stability, mm -hmm. right? Okay, and breadth, yes. and and Rice understands that, and um, and then McVicker carries on some of his work, and then as we said, brings in variety, entertainment, and intermission among other mm -hmm. um, innovations. Yeah. So um, this. Uh, I've got to read my own writing, which is really hard, actually. <laughs> I have, I have, I'll be so glad when the computers were invented. <laughs> yeah. um, now, I want to talk about Jane Addams, because this oh, yeah. actually surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't feel like this is discussed that much. I, I feel like I when I, when I discovered this in your book, I thought, Wow, this was a side, you know, Laura Laura is working on this uh, play about Jane Addams, and there are already so many things that, like she said, you know, do you know she was the first sanitation manager? And so she's a, a pretty versatile, interesting person, but she embraces theater. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell me about that? Well, I was surprised, like you, um, and I think... Her role in the development of theater in Chicago is what gave Chicago its own unique voice. You know, up until that time, uh, the, the common fair had been just touring productions out of New York, road shows of whatever had been popular at the time, with, of course, you know, production, you know, you'd have get get to see, you know, the great Bernhardt come through. And mm -hmm. Sarah he, Bernhardt. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and of course, everybody goes, Ooh, look at there. And mm -hmm. of course, the, the Booth family and what have you. Right. But part of her, uh, as part of her social agenda, Jane Addams recognized that theater would be crucial to helping her um, show the plight of the common or the, or the, or the common person or the plight of women. So. At that time, um, not only did Jane Addams theater program under the direction of Laura Dainty Pelham uh, illustrate social issues which were near and dear to both of their hearts, but it also opened up a new marketplace for theater. 
for the first time in this country, audiences were introduced to Ibsen, Shaw, Ionesco, mm -hmm. these these uh, these wonderful playwrights, um, and Euro these wonderful European playwrights whose uh, plays had not uh, heretofore had not been staged in America, and their productions were developed an audience for these. And it should be known that the whole house players themselves were rank amateurs. They were came out of the settlement program and they became damn good. So much so they not only toured this country, but they toured England and I, again, I'm not sure if they toured much else of Europe, but they were well known and they were a, a crack team of, of amateur actors who had just, they, uh, Mrs. Pelham and had been able to turn them into this wonderful ensemble. And yeah, so there you go. And then from there, <laughs> as time goes on, um, we, um, particularly in the 1940s, Theater games came out of Hull House. And from theater games, we got improvisation. Oh, I was just going to say improv. I did not know that that, wow, that connection. She she was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the Hull House players, we're talking to Pete Blatchford about his book, um, Wicked, Immoral, and Utterly Bad, A History of Chicago Theater. And we just talked about Jane Adams, and you may have heard of The Whole House, um, one of her many projects and enterprises, and her role in Chicago theater and theater in general. And the, the playwrights you've mentioned, like um, not so much Ionesco, but Shaw and Ibsen were writing yes. plays of great social significance. Um, uh, with um, the, and, and I think it might be worthwhile to say that the theater prior to it was probably pretty entertainment focused oh absolutely in you in know interspersed you know entertainment interspersed with bad productions of shakespeare right <laughs> right so maybe some slapstick <clears throat> and mm -hmm. caricature and you know to get the yucks and the tears and <clears throat> but what jane adams does bringing in this other influence, this European influence is say, yeah, but theater's this too. And you use the word social realism. Mm -hmm. So how did she understand that term? Or how did, how do you think Chicago theater goers understood that term social realism? <clears throat> well, I don't know how, I don't know how Chicago audiences, um, you know, responded to it or related to it, but you know, the, you just take, for example, the, the play, you know, Hedda Gabler. Mm -hmm. Pretty revolutionary at the time. Yes. And, but it was, it had a message in it which resonated strongly with um, Jane Addams. Right. And this was the kind of thing, she, you know, she understood that there was only so much she could do as director of Hull House. She needed right. uh, another way to reach people to understand what Hull House was all about. It was more than just bringing in people from other countries, assimilating them into this culture so that they could become successful Americans. Right. Was she, she was more than that. She, uh, because, you know, there were settlement houses all over the country, you know, it wasn't uh, they, from New York to, you know, Seattle, right. All the, right. Um, uh, but what made uh, Whole House unique was this theater program. Right, the Whole House players. Right. Um, she sees this as another way to get the message out. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, she's that intelligent and um, and that versatile. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say, I'm going to mention something else. So you'd said um, that the Whole House players came from settlements. They were rank amateurs. Um, and... It was another interesting discovery to me, uh, Lady Augusta Gregory. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to just read the quote. Um, By all means, start your own theater, but make it in your own image. Don't engage professional players. Mm -hmm. They have been spoiled for your purpose. Engage and train as we 
at the Abbey have done. So it's the Abbey Theater, right, in, in Dublin. Mm -hmm. So this is, is Adams picking up on Lady Augusta's idea or vice versa, or are they just happen to have the same idea about using amateurs? Well, I can't speak for Lady Gregory, but I think amateurs is what uh, Adams had. It's okay. what, it's what uh, Laura uh, Pelham had to work with. Okay. Um, and so hence amateurs. So this kind of theater was, um, was by chance um, exactly what Lady Gregory had called for. Uh, it was that I don't think you know they didn't they didn't audition outside of Whole House you know they they worked within like so many of their programs and they worked within they were a very inclusive sort of uh, organization and for the benefit of the people that lived there and worked there. Mm -hmm. And how was that received by the Chicago theater co community? Well, I think that. It took time to catch on, and they did not, by touring, they did not rely on Chicago mm -hmm. audiences for their mm -hmm. growth. Um, and they, uh, so I, I think it was a matter of just like, through you know, excellence in performance, through excellence in production values, and through great direction uh, by uh, Mrs. Pelham, um, that's how the reputation kind of grew. Okay, so let's go ahead and move to Maurice Brown. And again, these there's so many surprises in this book, and and um, you know you start to think about how much you take for granted. You know, I I really enjoy Chicago theater. The ten years that I got to enjoy it, I saw many marvelous productions. But some of the ones that meant the most to me were the ones that the number of the people in the audience outnumbered, you know, or excuse me, the cast outnumbered the audience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like Red Twist Theater, um, some of the smaller theaters that I got to see, The Edge, that I got to see these incredible productions. Mm -hmm. So Morris, uh, he is Brown and his wife start the American, the Little Theater Movement. Mm -hmm. How did they, why did they do it and how did they do that? Well, they were, I mean, with, without the whole house theater to have, you know, reputation of built on, it's very doubtful. Uh, Mr. Brown and his wife would have been successful, but they had an audience that they could tap into because of the success of the whole house players. As a matter of fact, um, Mr. Brown himself said, you know, it was not I who started the American little theater movement. It was Mrs. Pelham uh, and the whole house players. Uh, so, but he he carried on by producing productions uh, from European playwrights and um, another and another classical plays. Uh, again, it was amateurs. Amateurs, like, right? Again, they're they're not using professional. And when we say, let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. When we say professional actors, are we only thinking like James O'Neill and Joseph Jefferson? Yes. And so they're making their entire living through acting. Right. So these okay. people, these people um, were, you know, uh, these people were, mm, I guess you could, I guess you could, uh, they might be akin to today's uh, community theater actors. Okay. Uh, they, you know, they worked during the day and then they came to rehearsal at, at night. The amateurs, okay. He's okay. the amateur, right, amateurs. Much like the whole house players. They had their jobs to do during the day and then at night they would rehearse with uh, with Mrs. Pelham, uh, whatever their, whatever the next production. Um, however, the difference between the whole house players and Maurice Brown was uh, he he was following more in the in, in following the guidelines of Lady Gregory by mm -hmm. employing uh, you know amateurs. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just glad it's not my dog. <laughs> Can we help you? Hi, Mika. Is there something we can do for you? Hi, Mika. She's a, hey, I get to be in this show too. 
I'm just glad it, my, my pit bull finally decided whatever it was in the corner, she had to get out a ball. She finally gave up because I mm -hmm. thought, oh, how long is that? <laughs> Gotta love them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they say. Never go on stage with children and pets. Never do it. Don't <laughs> never, do it. Never stage. ever. You will. You will eat. They will eat the scenery. Um, so he he he's using amateurs as Lady Gregory recommends, and right. then he also creates this thing, art theater. And what is that? Let's do, let me talk about the art theater. Well, from what I understand. Um, well, well, first of all, why do we call it little theater? Because quite frankly, it was in, it was theater that was produced in little spaces. In little spaces. Um, and that's not what audiences were used to. When you would no. go to the theater, no. you would go to the theater and right. great, big, elegant places designed to take an audience and take them out of their selves to give them a real experience. Right. And, uh, um, and and the little theater movement was not about that. They, they were about producing socially relevant, whatever that means, productions that that would um, that would hopefully cause the audience to rise up and say, "Yeah, man, we're gonna go out." Right. We're gonna go out and women shouldn't have to be treated like women, that. Women, yeah. right, right? And the water should be clean, and uh, right. you know, yeah. Exactly. Um, so essentially, you know, that's what, it, that was their goal. Um, it was a naive goal, but it was an ambitious goal. Um, and his, you know, and the, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, his sort of, his ambition kind of got the better of him because, you know, he had these high ambitions for himself and he expected his cast to go along with it too. Okay. And they weren't getting paid. <laughs> and they were asked to work, you know, 12 hours a day and under difficult conditions. And, um, and, and that's ultimately why, you know, it, it failed here. Now, the art theater also combined, you know, lighting elements. Something he I saw here. that. So that's part of his like legacy, too, is emotional lighting. Because, right. again, prior to we've got the footlights, mm -hmm. right? And so the lighting is pretty standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now lighting becomes a design element. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, for the first, I mean, you, when, when you go to the theater nowadays, you shouldn't notice the lighting. Absolutely right. Do. That's right. Um, and like, uh, unlike music, which you can hear, which also does, you know, affect us as an audience members, the, you, you know, you know, you're feeling something, but when you, when you, there's that lighting element that changes and it enhances what the actors are doing and it enhances what the scene is all about. And it's all of these elements. I mean, the, the scene could be great just with the actors up there, you know, doing the thing that they do. But if you introduce these other elements, it just, uh, right. as Emerald said, it kicks it up a notch. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. you're not quite aware of it. And that, and that began here in Chicago. And, you know, Brown might have been a demanding taskmaster um, of his amateur, but he does have this legacy. And you also write that he has, he do, he really influences off-loop theater. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, he thought he was a failure. Um, and, but, you know, he, he, he wasn't. Because I, I think without experiments like the Little Theater, you know, we wouldn't have had the Goodman Theater, which right. was a little theater in its in the beginning, um, right? And, and he attracts, you say, literary the literati, right? Right. He brings the literati to Chicago, and that stabilizes deeper roots, and it and it gives intellectual uh, gravitas mm -hmm. to theater. How risky? Uh, how risky? What I guess I, have, I should have asked this at the beginning. How risky would it have been to open a theater with a very limited seating capacity? Well, unless yeah, uh, it would have been uh, it would have been very risky. I yeah, think, that's what I would think. Yeah, it would have been, uh, and it would have taken a lot of money. Uh, uh, now, Kenneth Sawyer Goodman. Um, one of the lessons that he took away from 
Maurice Brown was, well, he said, you know, if we're going to do this thing, we need to be associated with all with an established institution. And that's why the Goodman was built um, next to the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was, he was, you know, he was, you know, he was not only just an amateur playwright and, and you know, loved theater and had this little Chicago theater society, uh, but he was also a businessman and right. a fool. Um, right. So that was, that was the thing that, that was the big, as much as he admired Maurice Brown, that was his thing. You can't just go wing it. You can't just go, right. Just get a space. Right. And hope for if the you best. build it, they will come. That's not right. going to quite cut it. Yeah. That was the big takeaway that he had uh, from that, you know, as, you know, as, as great as Maurice Brown did, you know, he just thought he could just you know, will right. it into existence. And for a while it was very he successful. Did. He did. About a year, two years, about a year and a half, two years. It was Pretty Very good. successful. Yeah, their their production of Lisa Strada is you know is legendary. Mm -hmm. So just to go back to that question a little bit, when we talk about the theaters like the Iroquois or the Goodman or um, even a whole, who's funding any of the? I should say who's funding? Who are the people that are backing financially the early theaters in Chicago? Well, in the wake of the Chicago theater, uh, Chicago fire little artistic groups kind of sprang up around the city. Um, one of them was Kenneth Sawyer Goodman's uh, Chicago right. Theater Society. Right. Uh, and it was from these groups where funding came from. Uh, I think uh, I think Maurice Brown spent as much time uh, hobnobbing with the wealthy uh, patrons as he did directing his productions. When he wasn't in the theater directing, he was out, you know, asking, begging for money. <coughs> Um, Kenneth Sawyer Goodman, um, his, his, you know, his was, is probably the, you know, the better known of, of the other little theater societies, but he was already part from a wealthy family. And uh, when he died, it was his family, uh, that, that funded, that gave the initial funding for the creation of the Goodman theater. So, and the yeah, and the Goodman, just to clarify, and of course anyone in Chicago knows, theater knows, but it's the oldest conti and continually operating theater in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and since we're here, let's touch on that a little bit. So Kenneth Sawyer Goodman is part of the reason why. Why else has the Goodman endured, do you think? Well, I think because of innovation, which, uh, and, and also, you know, uh, the introduction of, you know, well, the program that they established, which was uh, Goodman's dream, where you would have amateur actors working alongside professional actors. That's what he wanted. And out of that came the, uh, the, the children's theater program. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it was, you know, for a long time, it was you know, this sort of, <coughs> it was, uh, it was a school also. And that was another part of, that was the other leg of the stool, you know, where you would create these, um, these, right. these wonderfully socially relevant programs, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. work, amateurs working along with uh, amateurs and, right. uh, and you would have these, um, and the children's theater program as well. Um, so I think that was, that's how they began. As time went on, um, they needed to change. And I think, uh, I believe it was Gregory Mosier, Robert Falls in the late 70s, early 80s, recognized what was going on in the off-loop theater movement and reached mm -hmm. out to people mm -hmm. like David Mamet. Um, mm -hmm. That's why the Goodman Theater is still with us. Had okay. continued on a tra trajectory of just doing sort of, you know, retreads of old, you know, tired works that had been done to death. Um, right. We might not have a Goodman Theater today, but it was through foresightedness on the part of, you know, future generations that the uh, Goodman is still as vibrant and <laughs> vital. Oh, absolutely. Place yeah. Today. Absolutely. And they've expanded on that. Now that you have the main stage and you've got uh, uh, some alternate, you, you, some uh, studio spaces too, 
um, which was you know another master stroke by the Goodman leaders. Um, Absolutely. Uh, you have the Owen and the Albert really kind of dedicated to different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right about the children's, the uh, playwrights and residents, very different programs, a very diversified the, the theatrical experience um, in, in terms of innovation, production, uh, you know, incubation. Um, we're talking to author Pete Blatchford, uh, author and actor Pete Blatchford, I have the pleasure to work with about his book. I'm going to get this right eventually with a weird, uh, wicked, immoral, <coughs> and utterly bad, an illustrated history of Chicago theater. And, you know, pick the book up, go to the good minute since we're talking about it and buy it from the bookstore or go Barnes and Noble, Amazon, find it online. And you can also message me for more information. We've got a lot more to cover and I think we'll talk a little bit more. And then I think I want to have you back to do kind of the, the kind of from the uh, early 20th century on because there's so much history. But can you talk about a little bit about the Chicago Theater Society? So what's their, in, what, who are they and what's their influence in this time of early 1900s? Um, to be fair, it was an organization which enabled Kenneth Sawyer Goodman to be able to write his little plays. That's essentially what it was. And it, they were also, um, they also funded other theatrical projects. Um, but it was, it was a societal thing, you know, people with excess money, you know, you have to do something with it. And it was the thing at the time. So, you know, it was, it, in and, in and of itself, the Chicago Theater Society wasn't that big a deal. Right. Except for the fact that one of the founding members was someone who would, who would become well-known and a major theater in town would bear his name. In his name, right. Uh, so, but it, <coughs> it was, it would, uh, it was like so many other organizations that championed productions. Um, I think that uh, if there was a difference, it was the fact that you know uh, Kenneth did have this vision, right? Uh, uh, in you know Bernice passion that he had, and it's 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 only a shame that he did, that he didn't live to to see it. Um, he you know he in joined the army during world war one and was a victim of influenza pandemic. Yeah. But, um, had he lived, well, you know, it might've taken a little bit longer for the Goodman to actually come into fruition. So, um, and, but in 1922, it was his parents who uh, were the ones who said, well, we're going to create this memorial for our son. Right. Um, <clears throat> so from it's a, what we've covered so far, 1837, <clears throat> to 1922. What's amazing is how theater starts as this um, entertainment vehicle that is looked at askance, um, is not particularly welcomed, certainly has no large financial backing or endorsement. And through what is about eight decades, right, eight or nine decades, <clears throat> makes this transformation into something that is not only financially backed, um, but also given some credibility and much more resources and attention. <clears throat> quite, a, quite a journey in under 100 years. Indeed, indeed. And is what happening in Chicago, is it being mimicked? in New York and um, other theater hubs, or is it unique? Is that transformation unique to Chicago, or do you see the same kind of legitimization happening elsewhere? In my opinion, it was unique to Chicago, because New York was <clears throat> New York, and because it, it had a status of being America's theater capital, I mean, that's where the money was. That's where the audiences right. were. Right. You know, Chicago right. was... For a long, long time, you know, in the middle of the Midwest, you know, at the time of the Great Chicago Fire in 1871, if you were to uh, 
travel about a mile outside of the city, you'd be in prairie country for God's sake. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it was still thought of as provincial, a provincial little town. Right. Uh, right. The, you know, the major advantage was it was at a crossroads and, you know, in time you, it, it was all the other thing that it, it, around the turn of the century or, and, and into the 1920s, it did have uh, house a lot of booking agencies. Mm -hmm. um, the Marx brothers <clears throat> moved from New York to Chicago. They lived on a farm outside of Chicago, but the, and, and they would book their, uh, their, um, their tours across America um, to um, from Chicago. And that's, that's cool. Where they developed their personalities. That's cool. And I think there were like six of them at one time and mm -hmm. whittled down just to the four and then to the three. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think that um, Chicago then, as it as it does now, still has kind of a chip on its shoulder. Sure, but, sure. It does, actually. Sure. And, you know, you're not going to go to a New York theater person and get a serious conversation necessarily about Chicago. Look at all the productions that, are, that were from Chicago that failed. I mean, mm -hmm. I, there was a great production. I don't know if you saw it. It was a, a production of, of Hauptmann. Um, oh, are you talking about the Hauptmann, um, uh, John Logan yeah. Hauptmann? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, where, was, what, what production, which one did you meet? Oh, see? I saw, I saw the original and then the remounting in the early nineties. Okay. Uh, I didn't was, see that one. It was a huge hit. They got together a lot of the same cast. And of course they got Dennis mm -hmm. Lair, who, as we know now is often doing wonderful things in TV and film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when they brought it to New York, there was still a lot of bad feeling about that trial um, because you're not going to convince a New Yorker or someone from New Jersey that Halton was innocent. You're not going to do right. it. They that, they, that, they that's do a, not want to hear it. That's <laughs> a great, that's a great play. I saw a, a brilliant off loop production of that in the last 10 years. Um, it is a, a very good play. It's play I would love to direct. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, there is a chip, you know, there's a different crucible for uh, Chicago theater. What, what comes out and survives, I think it's, um, you know, kind of like the namesake of Chicago, the, the weed, you know, it comes out and survives because of these other forces mm -hmm. of um, the intersection and because of the um, uh, looking at it askance and saying, well, you know, it's not New York. Um, and yet I've, I have seen absolutely amazing theater, and it's also very accessible theater. Um, you know, price-wise, uh, parking-wise, uh, location-wise, I there was never a day of the year other than you know dark Mondays or Tuesdays that I couldn't have found at least you know a handful of excellent productions that I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so it's just it's to me it's it's bar it's bar none yeah. um so i want to ask you a few things and then if you'll come back i would love to talk about sure the 20th century that'd be great That's do good. do um i mean let me tie in i did have this question and i think maybe it ties into what we just talked about why do you think chicago theater history is important to theater history well Without it, I mean, for example, the, we mentioned the uh, the national fire laws that were established in the wake of the Iroquois Theater fire. We uh, we mentioned that Chicago was largely responsible for creating an audience nationwide, eventually, for important European playwright right. and theater voices. Right. Um, you know, the development of uh, the little theater. You, know, you don't have to have you know, large theater houses, you know, you can have an intimate thing and the experience is, is different. Um, and in, and it, it works well for, you know, sort of social dramas. Um, and it, as opposed to the larger houses, like, you know, the, the Schubert and uh, right. you know, those, those kinds of uh, houses that were um, larger. <laughs> the, the, the Schubert's had a theater in every, every city. They weren't unique to Chicago. Um, so I think, and then of course, eventually the, the role of improvisation. That's absolutely right. 
I think those are very good, um, amazing reasons to say, you know, uh, why why it was significant to theater history in general. Um, when we come back, um, Pete, I want to talk about the future of Chica where Chicago theater is and the future of it. I do want to mention one more time, we're talking to Pete Blatchford. The book is Wicked, um, <laughs> Memorial and Utterly Bad, an Illustrated History of Chicago Theater. Fascinating, fascinating book. If you have any interest in Chicago theater or theater history in general, I can't recommend it enough. Um, and Pete is is not only a, a good author, he's, he's a good actor. He's fun to work with. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> You go to the website, which is wickedchicagostage.com. You can see excerpts from the book, uh, as well as being able to purchase it there. But if you want to see, kind of get a flavor of what, what's in the book, there are some uh, images from the book with little descriptions uh, from the various periods. Um, and so I invite people to, if you're curious before you want to buy it, you want to say, well, what am I getting myself into? Um, feel free to take advantage of uh, uh, the website. Okay. And again, it's wicked. Chicagostage.com. Mm -hmm. um, when we come back next time, we'll talk about the last 80 years. So starting with the 20s and the Depression, and and what how he, how it evolves. I was going to bring up Ben Hecht next. Um, how it evolves uh, and and uh, diversifies and becomes this um, amazing the uh, city of theater. So um, before we go, Pete, what would you uh, just a kind of quick question? What would you like people to take away from the book? <clears throat> I think that people need to understand the role that Chicago has played in American theater history. You know, I, I, I realize it's probably an uphill battle because, you know, when people think American theater, they think New York, and that's kind of a hard thing to get out of people's mind. <coughs> Dang it, you got, you got me doing it now. <laughs> um, I think they should know that, okay, you know, we're in the cross, we're in the middle of the, uh, we're in the middle West, you know, but, but we, Chicago theater has been a place where people have taken their dreams, mm -hmm. where no one else wanted to hear from them. Maurice mm -hmm. took his dream here. Right. And Claire Goodman created his dream here. It was eventually fully realized. Mm -hmm. Hell, Jane Addams took her dream here. And part mm -hmm. of her dream was the theater program. Right. Um, and, you know, even John Rice, his dream was to establish a good reputation for theater here in Chicago so that good, hardworking, decent people could come, take a Saturday night off, and enjoy a wonderful performance. Mm -hmm. um, that, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, in some cases, uh, we've been fr we've been freer to experiment. Yep. Right. Um, I think in New York, there's mm -hmm. been more pressure to get Absolutely. a product out there that will make money. Money. Yep. I think in Chicago. Money is important. Making money on your production is important, but it is not the most important thing. Right. Um, so there's more room for experiment. Um, so yeah, that that that's what I would that's what I would tell people. I think that's a great message. And yes, when you can walk into a theater and the cast outnumbers the audience, or you know you're squished up against the person next to you in a forty seat house, mm -hmm. and you're about to see something that's going to blow you away. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it is different and it is more freeing than when you have to produce to pay a rent exactly. that's quite high. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an appetite for this kind of theater too. Is there an appetite for the tried and the true and the big and the bold and the mute? Sure. 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 Absolutely. But, but um, at the same time, if you want to see cutting edge and different and dark and whatever, it's there in Chicago. Well, and a lot of the things that, you know, were 
kind of at one ed- at one time edgy are now mainstream. Mainstream. <clears throat> That's right. Gibson and Shaw and um, That's right. Those you know, those European playwrights. Those are classics. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, uh, the, what was once foreign and strange and elusive is now you know. You know, now, it's part of the fabric now. It is. It's, yeah, it's just part of the repertoire. Um, but when we come back next time, Pete, I'd like to I'd like to ask you not only the future of theater, Chicago theater, but also what you think the penultimate Chicago play is. So you can think on that. <laughs> you can think on that. It's been a delight talking to Pete Blatchford, the author of Wicked, Immoral, and Utterly Bad an illustrated history of Chicago theater from 1837 to 1974. We'll come back with Pete in a week or two and we'll discuss from, uh, we stopped at about 1920 and we'll discuss from 1920 to 1974 because lots happening and we'll want to get into that. But it was a fascinating and educating talk, uh, looking at uh, just that period of about 80, 90 years and what Chicago was doing. And, and, you know, we, Chicago, of course, was, uh, many things were happening, the white city and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, all, um, music was getting established in art and, um, Chicago was flourishing, but so was theater. So, yeah. yes, there was, there was a big artistic re- uh, renaissance mm-hmm. that encompassed multi multiple disciplines, Abs- architecture, after yeah. the fire. And, and a lot of that was um, motivated by the desire to have the World's Fair here. So I mm-hmm. think other people said, hey, well, you know, let's, uh, let's see what we can do, too. It's, right. This is fertile ground. Yes, fertile ground. That's, that's exactly the word. And, and uh, people were, uh, they wanted to show the world that, you know, Chicago's back, baby, you know, and we're back. It is. And I think that's one other thing we could say is that through the fires, the destruction, the panic of 18, is that resurrecting force Mm -hmm. really does shape a kind of a grittiness Mm -hmm. and a, a, uh, uh, I want to say, I want to say an endurance Mm -hmm. um, that uh, I think still exists today. Hey, if you can get through Chicago winters, you can get through almost anything. <laughs> well, I like yeah. um, I, I like to close with maybe just this quote from the, okay. <clears throat> this is from Hugh Dalziel Duncan. Okay. One of the great ironies of our time is the sense of inferiority Chicagoans have about the culture of their city. The image of Chicago as a city of violence, crime political graft is familiar enough. But the image of Chicago is a white city whose gleaming towers would stand beside an inland sea to create a new Athens in America is not so well known. And who was that quote from? Uh, Hugh Duncan. I can't pronounce his middle name. Del- and that was and that was in reference I mean, and he was what was his He was an was author. An author. I can't, I, I uh, my mother had these books on uh, Chicago on, uh, Midwest history, and it was one that I'd seen that was on the book jacket or inside. Mm-hmm. That pretty much will summons help summons up. Uh, I think that's a great. I think that's a great. Um, yes, I think that's a great uh, quote. And just want to point out, we got a nice comment from a Facebook user that said found this very informative. Oh, great! Um, and so, yes. Um, I hope you will buy the book and I hope you will tune in next time or um, when we come back to the 20th century, more of the 20th uh, century and Chicago's fascinating history with author Pete Blatchford. Pete, thanks for taking tonight to talk to us. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Um, I will see everyone soon with our production next weekend Mm -hmm. of Karen Williams' play, The Art of Necessity. Um, And we'll be back to talk to Pete again soon. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much.